Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 10 through 17 this morning. Malachi 2, 10 through 17. This is now the word of God. Do we not all have one Father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously each against his brother so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, may the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob everyone who awakes and answers or who presents an offering to the Lord of hosts. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But no one has done this who has a remnant of the Spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit, and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. And him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, how have we wearied him? And that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or, where is the God of justice? Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning because you are our God. And we come, Lord, to study your word. We come, Lord, to hear from you. And we pray that you would speak to us. Father, I pray that you would give me clarity of thought and clarity of word. That I might make your word clear to your people. But more than anything, God, may your spirit, who is our teacher, be the one who teaches us and guides us and instructs us and shows us what it is you would have us to know. We ask you to speak, Lord, and we pray that you grant us hearts to hear and hearts to listen and apply and obey you. Lord, we trust in you at this time, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've been with us on our study of the book of Malachi, you know we're dealing with the issue of indifference. That's the sin that's mainly plaguing Israel. It shows up in various ways, but you have a children of Israel here in the book of Malachi who are eager for their Messiah to come. They're eager for the Lord to come and set up his kingdom and rule on the earth and rule from his throne, and they really want him to come. They've now come back from Babylon. Zerubbabel's temple has been rebuilt. It's been here for 100 years at this point. They're settled in, and all they really feel like they're missing and waiting on is for the king to come. And the message of Malachi very simply is, you're not ready for the king to come. You're not ready if he were to show up. He would not be pleased with you. And the sin of the day is very simply the sin of indifference. We've seen indifference in their worship so far because they were bringing the lame and the broken and the crippled for sacrifice. And they bring it to God as though this is good enough and say, here, fine, God, you'll take this, right? And God said, I am a great king. You wouldn't present that to your governor And yet you bring that to me? Such indifference and disdain for God. We saw their indifference last week in their neglect of God's word. You have priests who don't listen to God's word, who don't take God's word to heart, who don't teach God's word, who don't enforce God's word, who don't apply God's word. And God looks at that and sees it as great indifference. They were supposed to honor what he had to say and they did not. They were more concerned with their own opinions. And all of this is indifference. This morning we move forward. And it's another message of indifference from Malachi to these people. It is a burden of God, as we found out in chapter 1, verse 1. And this time, the indifference that Israel shows is an indifference towards sin. There's a sin that is occurring in the congregation. They're not grieving over it. They're not mourning over it. They're not repenting of it. Instead, they continue to participate in it, and they go so far as to declare to one another, don't worry about it, God is pleased with you anyway. They love and participate in that which God hates, and instead of repenting, they declare that God delights in us just as we are. They've lost their moral barometer. 
they've totally missed their understanding of sanctification. God is terribly offended by what they're doing and no one seems to care. That's indifference. The uh, really, you know, sort of buzzword in our passage this morning, we saw it five times actually in verses 10 through 17, is the word treacherously. You see it in verse 10. Why do we deal treacherously with our brother? In verse 11, Judah has dealt treacherously and an abomination. You see it again in verse 14. You've dealt treacherously with your wife of your youth. In 15, let no one deal treacherously against the wife. Again in verse 16, don't deal treacherously. That's the word. In the Hebrew, it's bogad. And it literally means to act deceitfully. Or it means betrayal. Don't betray. Don't act deceitfully. Don't give your word and then go back on it. That's a betrayal. And that's what treacherously means. And when you look at our text, you'll see why God throws this word at them. Look at verse 10 for a second and let's start there. God asked the question, do we not all have one father? Has not God created us? Now the word I want you to see in that is the word one. That's the real important word. We have one father. We are different people, many people, but we have one father. And we are many people, but we have one God. Now, obviously, anytime you speak of there being one father or one God, the issue that arises out of that is the issue of idolatry. You can read all the way back in Deuteronomy 6, in which God said in that famous Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That's the Shema. They were to speak it every morning. They were to put it as frontals on their forehead and bind it on their arm. Jesus called it the greatest commandment. And it begins with the reality that the Lord is one. We don't worship many gods. We don't worship a multitude of gods. We're not like Hindus with their thousands and thousands of gods. We worship one God, right? He's one. One God, that's who we worship, that's who we obey. In fact, our basis for unity and the basis of our identity is all bound up in the fact that we love and serve and worship one God. That's our unity. That's our identity. In John 17, Jesus said, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Most of the time that passage is portrayed as though Jesus is praying that his children will all get along. Won't they all just get along? And if they'll just get along, then the world will know that I'm your son. He's not praying for that. Jesus doesn't pray prayers that don't get answered. If he's praying that we all get along, then God did not answer that prayer because you know, as I know, there's plenty of division even amongst God's people in the world. He's not praying for harmony. He's praying for unity, common life. You are one God. I am your one son. I am in you and you are in me and I want them in us. Bind us together with one common life. That's what he's speaking of. It's a positional, practical unity. This is where we unite. We may be diverse people. We look different. We sound different. Sometimes we speak different languages. We have totally different tastes, totally different preferences. We don't all like the same kinds of food. And yet we all come together because we share one common father. And we share one common God. That's the basis of unity and identity. You're going to understand that this week in a secular sense. Many of you are going to celebrate Thanksgiving this week. And some of you may travel to a relative's house. Some may have a lot of relatives come to your house. And you're going to have people who are going to gather around your table that you don't agree with. You're going to have people of different religious beliefs. You're going to have different people of different political beliefs. We all have that one crazy uncle and that one outspoken cousin, right? We, we all know that. And they're going to sit around your table, and there's going to be some disagreement. Hopefully, you kind of let all that go. But you're, you're going to be eating with people that you don't agree with. And sometimes, in some cases, they're people that you might not really otherwise hang out with. But why are you with them on Thursday? Why are you gathered around the table? Because you all came from the same grandpa, right? You all, you all share one thing in common. We've got the same great granddaddy. And so even though we don't agree on anything but motherhood, we know that we all come from the same one and that's what unifies us. We're family, whether we like it or not, right? Well, that's true in the church. Hopefully it's easier to get along because God does do a work in our hearts. But the reality is, of all of our differences... 
and all of the things that make us different, we really come together based on one thing, and that is that we all love the same God and we all share the same Father. That's our unity, that's our identity. Ephesians chapter four says, there is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. That's our basis for unifying. That's our basis for our identity. Now, since the label and basis of our fellowship is the fact that we have one God, you understand, it would be totally out of place for someone to enter this place and worship a different God. That'd be out of place, wouldn't it? That wouldn't fit. Now, we, we may disagree on some things, and we may get at odds over some things that are minor things, but what would be totally out of place is if someone came in here and said, can we have a moment where we stop and pray to Allah instead of to God? And we would say, sorry, that doesn't fit. We, we have one unifying thing here, even though we may not agree on everything, we all know we worship one God and we have one Father. And if you were to enter and try to worship some other God, that wouldn't fit. That, that wouldn't fit why we are here. That would miss the whole point. It should be understood that when you walk through those doors, regardless of our differences, the common truth is that we are all here to worship the same God. That ought to be understood. And Israel should have known that. However, that's not what is happening. Instead of acting faithfully, Malachi says they were acting treacherously. Treacherously each against his brother, treacherously against God, treacherously against the wife of your youth. That is to say they have walked in betrayal. They have been unfaithful to their brother, unfaithful to their wife, unfaithful to their God. And you say, well, man, what did they do? What's happening? Well, in short, and you'll see this as we work through it, you have men in Israel who are divorcing their Hebrew wives. This girl that they met, you know, when they were in their teens and they fell in love and they married together and they formed a covenant before God to be marriage and maybe they had kids and that was the wife of their youth. But as they've grown a little older in life, now they see this other little fling over here and she sure is cute, only she's a pagan and she worships a foreign god. And so these men are now divorcing the wife of their youth and they're going to marry this new pagan fling over here. And if that's not enough, they're bringing her right into church with all of her idolatry and all of her paganism. In fact, she is called the daughter of a foreign god. That means she's idolatrous. She's not a convert. She's not a pagan that's converting to Judaism. She is remaining in her sin, and these men have brought her in. And that's terrible. Terrible to divorce your wife. Terrible to marry a pagan fling. Terrible to bring her to church. And if that's not enough, the congregation is throwing open arms around her, acting like, oh, this is wonderful congratulations. We're so happy for you that you finally found the love of your life. And God looks down upon all this and he says one thing, treacherous. It is betrayal. And it's not just betrayal of your wife. It's betrayal of your brother. It's betrayal of God. That's sort of the gist of what's going on here. It is an indifference about sin and the destructive nature of sin in the congregation. So let's work our way through the text. We're going to look at the treachery of Israel. First of all, you see betrayal of your brother. Let's look at this. Betrayal of your brother. Look at verses 10 to 12. Do we not all have one father? Has not one God created us? And of course, the implied answer there is yes. And based on that, he says, well, then why do we deal treacherously each against his brother so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously, and abomination has been committed in Israel and Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, may the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob everyone who awakes and answers or who presents an offering to the Lord of hosts. Now you see there's treachery, and he says it's treachery against your brother. First John taught us, as we studied recently, that if you don't love your brother... You don't love the Father. If you don't have brotherly love, you have no claim on Christianity at all, and yet that's what's going on here. They are dealing treacherously, and treacherously to such an extent that God says it is to profane the covenant of our fathers, verse 10. I mean, this isn't just a minor, minor little disagreement. This isn't just something that, you know, two brothers got cross about, that, you know, I like the cowboys and I like the eagles or whatever else it's i like the stuffing in the bird and i like it outside the bird this isn't some little insignificant squabble this is something so big that god says it is a total violation of the covenant god made with your fathers 
You are obliterating the whole point and purpose of it all. You say, what have you done? Verse 11, you dealt treacherously. We get that. An abomination, there's a word for you, an abomination has been committed in Israel and Jerusalem. You didn't just commit a matter of sin. You, you did something so horrific that God labels it an abomination. It, it's something that ought never to be conceived of or done. He says that Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves. You've done something to God's sanctuary, God's temple. You have defiled it, and you have married the daughter of a foreign god. Now think about what he just said. You committed treachery against your brother. Now when I say that, if I say you have sinned against your brother, you're thinking that it's going to be something really direct against the brother, like you stole money from him or you, you know, had an affair with his wife. You, you did something specifically to a brother to harm him in some specific pertinent way. That's sort of what you expect. But when they say, how are we sinning against our brother?, the answer is, you married a pagan woman. And we say, well, how, how is that a sin against my brother? I mean, we know our culture, right? Our culture is, it doesn't affect anybody but me. Mind your own business. What does my private life have to do with my brother? It shouldn't be up to my brother who I want to marry. And if I want to divorce my wife and marry that pagan woman, I have every right. And that, frankly, is none of my brother's business. That's what we would say, isn't it? That's what our culture would say. And yet God said, wrong. In your sin, you are betraying your brother. What you are doing is betraying your brother because you are profaning the sanctuary where your brother worships. Now, you go this week for Thanksgiving... And you gather in there with all of your family and you sit around the table and one of your relatives jumps in the middle and jumps on the table and starts stomping on all the dishes of food and kicks the turkey across the room and runs out the door. Let me ask you something. Will you say that he ruined your Thanksgiving? Well, I know Karen's saying no because she's going to be thankful in all things. You would too. You'd say you ruined Thanksgiving. How dare you walk in here and act like that? You ruined it for everybody. See, what you do affects those around you. And what you do and how you live splatters. It's not just you. And even the decisions and sins which you think are for you and you alone, private things and you're not hurting anybody, that's a lie. Every sin you commit hurts everybody. Ask Adam. I'll just eat a piece of fruit. It's only going to affect me, after all. Yeah, right. Sin entered the world through one man, and sin spread to all men. Thanks, great, 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 great granddaddy Adam, right? You sinned, and it affected us all. How about Achan? Anybody remember him? He's called the troubler of Israel. God sent him into Jericho, and he said, Look, I'm going to give Jericho into your hands, but I'm putting Jericho under the ban. What does that mean? It means if it's alive, kill it. And if it'll burn, burn it. And if it won't, bring it to me. But don't you keep anything under the ban. But oh, Achan, he saw something there in one of the houses that he thought he wanted. So he took it and he buried it in his tent. And he was a happy man. And then when Israel goes out to battle the next day against Ai, you remember what happens? God overthrows them. And Israel loses to Ai. And Joshua comes back and he falls on his face and says, I don't get it. You brought us into this land, what, to kill us? Everybody's going to hear about this. And we're doomed. And God said, get up and quit whining. Someone in your midst has sinned against me. And so they go and start casting lots. And it comes to Achan. And Achan confesses. He's called the troubler of Israel. And they, they stoned Achan, his wife, his kids, his livestock, everything he owned. Because he brought trouble on Israel by his sin. I'm not hurting anybody, Achan could have said. It's not affecting anybody but me, except it is. You remember the man in Corinth who was sleeping with his father's wife and the people of Corinthians were boasting about it. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? What's that mean? It spreads, doesn't it? You bring sin into this congregation and it will spread. It will not just affect you. Other people will see it and follow your footsteps. It happens. Here, the specific sin is they're marrying a pagan woman. By the way, expressly forbidden by God. In Exodus 34, 
Be sure to observe what I'm commanding you this day. Behold, I am going to drive out the Amorite before you and the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Watch yourself that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you are going, or it will become a snare in your midst. But rather you are to tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and cut down their asherim. For you shall not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Otherwise you might make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they would play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods. And someone might invite you to eat of his sacrifice, and you might take some of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters might play the harlot with their gods and cause your sons also to play the harlot with their gods." I mean, God said, go into that land and kill them and tear down their altars. You say, why? Because here's what might happen. You might accidentally go to one of their feasts and you might accidentally fall into worship of their gods. And you might see that one of their daughters is pretty and say, hey, son, you want to see his daughter? She's pretty. And you might give your son to marry their daughter and you might give your daughter to marry their son. And your kids might accidentally fall into that pagan worship because I remember dad did it. Do you see how it'll spread? God said, you've got to root it out. No covenants with them at all. In Deuteronomy 7, when the Lord your God brings you into the land where you're entering to possess it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them before you and you defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them and show no favor to them. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. God's, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will quickly destroy you. Don't do it, God said. Don't dabble in it. You're going to invite sin into the congregation. You're going to invite God's displeasure into the congregation. And Israel should have known this. They've already learned this lesson. I mean, do we remember when Moses in the wilderness walks through and the children of Israel want to marry some of the Moabite women? And what happened? God sent a plague and killed 24,000 of them. 24,000 people died amongst the nation of Israel because they married foreign women. Or how about a few years later in 1 Kings 11? Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after their gods. Solomon held fast to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully as David his father had done. Solomon married foreign women, introduced through those foreign women all that pagan worship. You see them under really one heading in the time of Israel, and it's called Baal. Baal is just a word that means master, and it was sort of a universal term for a lot of foreign gods. And the children of Israel never quit worshiping the Baals until finally God obliterated them and kicked them out of their land for 70 years and sent them to Babylon. Solomon's sin was just his own personal problem. Solomon's sin doesn't affect anybody else, what I do or how I live. No, it affected the whole nation. It led the whole nation into idolatry, and they all were judged because of it. Your sin will splatter. It will affect others. And that's why you have Ezra and Nehemiah and Malachi in this day, and they're all so upset because my intermarrying with these pagan women, you were sinning against your brother. You were doing that which God said don't do, and that's going to invite God's displeasure upon us, and your sin is likely to spread and permeate and the next thing you know, somebody else is going to come in with their pagan wife. So you have to learn this, first of all, church. Your sin is a betrayal against your brother. Even that sin which you think is private. Even that sin which you think affects only you. Even that sin which you think is none of anybody else's business. That is not true. We are called to be our brother's keeper. You are accountable to your brother. Your sin is a betrayal of your brother. Your sin is a betrayal of the church. We are those who gather and seek the Lord's favor. And if you would be willing to bring iniquity and sin into the congregation, that's a betrayal of the church. It's affecting other believers. That's called indifference. In 1 Corinthians 12, 26, Paul said, If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. To betray is an issue of brotherly love. And it's not just to betray your brother. It's also to insult God. 
Look at what he says. He says in verse 11, You've committed this abomination in Israel and Jerusalem, for Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. So you've profaned God's sanctuary. Now look at verse 12. As for the man who does this, may the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob everyone who awakes and answers or who presents an offering to the Lord of hosts. Now you see God's response to this treachery. The man who does this, that is the man who marries this pagan wife, this man who parades her into church. And God says, as the one who does this, what's the request? What is it God would do in verse 12? As for the man who does this, may the Lord what? Cut him off. You know what that means? Kill him. In the Old Testament, it meant kill him. May he be cut off from the land of the living, actually. Cut off from the tents of Jacob. He says, and everyone who awakes and answers or who presents an offering to the Lord of hosts. Uh, that awakes and answers statement is cause for a lot of question and commentaries when you read it because apparently it was a figure of speech in the day of Israel that's not readily translatable to us. But it seems to mean this. In their day, you had a watchman who would gather outside the city and if he saw an enemy approaching, the job of the watchman was to wake everybody up and say, pay attention, danger is lurking. And so sometimes you even see the prophets of Israel described as watchmen. Ezekiel is called a watchman. Now, the picture here is that someone, a watchman, confronted you in your sin, woke you up and said, stop doing that. But instead of submitting, you talked back. Instead of submitting, you argued. Said, you can't tell me what to do. I can marry whoever I want to marry. It's none of your business. Get out of my house, whatever it may be. You debated and talked back and argued. Remember, James said, be quick to listen, slow to speak when you're dealing with the word of God. Don't argue with him. That's what they were doing. Also, Malachi mentions the man who presents an offering to the Lord of hosts. So what are they doing? Here's a man that's living in willful sin. Somebody may have warned him, but he won't listen to it. He's divorced his wife. He's married a pagan woman, an idolatrous woman, and he brings her right into the worship service so that they can together worship God, so that they can present an offering to the Lord. No repentance, no sorrow, no grief, they just feel at liberty in their sin to walk right in there and participate in the corporate worship. You may remember, you may remember what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 23. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. I mean, you need to deal with righteousness before you show up in some charade in public worship. Remember when Saul disobeyed God, he gave the Amalekites into his hand and told Saul, similar to Jericho, kill everything, but he didn't. He spared some of the livestock and he spared Agag, remember? And Samuel comes up and he says, why didn't you obey God? And Saul said, I did obey God. To which Samuel said, then what are the sheep I keep hearing, right? And you get it in 1 Samuel 15, 22. Samuel said, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. What you have going on now is an insult to God. Because you have a man who's divorced his wife and married a pagan, that's a sin against the brother, and he's brought her into worship, and he's going through all the motions like everything is good. That's a mockery. That's an insult to God. And God sits here and says, I think that person needs to be cut off. Yeah, that person needs to be removed. That is indifference to the commands of God. That is indifference to brotherly love. That is indifference to the sanctity of pure worship. He's betraying his brother. He's parading his sin. He's threatening to influence the congregation. He's inviting the judgment of God into their midst. And God says, may they be cut off. And just so you don't think that is too, you know, bizarre Old Testament cruel teaching or whatever. In the New Testament, when your brother sins, what's Jesus tell you to do? Go to him. And hopefully he'll repent and you've won your brother. Be the watchman, wake him up. And if he doesn't listen to you, do what? Take another one with you, right? I mean, we're trying to win this brother. Take another one with you. If he listens to you, great, you've won your brother. If not, tell it to the congregation. And if he'll listen to the congregation, great, you've won your brother. But if this guy won't leave his sin, and he won't turn from what he's doing, what did Jesus say to do? Let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, Right? cut him off. Why? Is that cruel? Listen, 
Worship is designed to be that which pleases God in holy sincerity and truth. Worship is supposed to be a safe place where your brother will not get influenced into sin. And we cannot, nor are we ever allowed to be, a congregation that takes a blind eye towards sin or a deaf ear towards sin that just says, oh, it's no big deal, we're all fine, God won't care, come on in, and then go through the motions as though everything is well. That cannot be the case. That has never been okay in Israel. That was never okay to Jesus. Paul told the church at Corinth, I have already handed that immoral brother over to Satan so that it won't influence the whole church. This can't be allowed to remain. That is indifference towards sin and is highly offensive to God. It is a betrayal, first of all, of your brother. Let's keep going. Secondly, God says there is a betrayal of your wife and kids. A betrayal of your wife and kids. Look at verses 13 to 16. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. I mean, that just adds to their hypocrisy, doesn't it? They're showing up and going through the motions like they really care what God thinks. I mean, they show up at the altar and they just weep and they cry and they just don't understand why God won't accept their offering. They won't leave their sin, but they just, they're going through a real motion here. Yet you say, for what reason? You know, God, what's wrong? Why won't you accept our offering? Because the Lord has been a witness against you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously. You betrayed her, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But not one has done so who is a remnant of the Spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit, and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. And him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. The first segment showed us what was happening at the church. This guy walking in with his new bride on her arm. Now we've backed up and we're looking at what took place at home. It's still a betrayal. God still sees it. God won't accept their offerings. They say, why? And God says, because I'm a witness between you and the wife of your youth. Do you remember your wedding? Here before God, you stood before me and you made a vow, a covenant, a commitment to that woman and she made a vow, a covenant, commitment to you before me. I was a witness at your wedding that you were going to marry this woman and forsake all others, that you were going to marry this man and forsake all others. I was a witness. So here I am now as a witness to say, you broke the deal. You've behaved treacherously. That's your wife. That's your companion. You entered into a covenant with her. And you are betraying her. How? Well, verse 16 makes it clear. I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. Apparently, these men in Israel were so enamored with these pagan women, they wanted to marry them. And I'm going to go ahead and give kudos to the Hebrew wives who said, well, I'm not going to let you marry them and stay with me. I mean, thankful. To which the man apparently said, see ya. You get out of here, I'm going to marry her. I found a wife that is more pleasing in my sight. I'm going to get rid of the first wife and I'm going to marry the new one. God calls it treachery. God calls it betrayal. And God says, I hate that. Stop and let that sink in. Nobody can deny divorce has plagued our culture. It's plagued our nation. In fact, you don't even hear sermons on divorce anymore because it is probably the touchiest subject to touch because every preacher knows if I stand up and preach on divorce, it's going to be really personal to probably at least half of my congregation. And so we've reached a point where it really isn't even touched anymore. It's not even addressed. That's how bad it's become. It just kind of just don't talk about it. Now look, we, we want to be fair and right and honest to the Bible. The Bible does permit divorce. If you're married... And your spouse commits adultery, they just shattered that covenant. And the Bible says, you're not bound. You can leave. If they, they have an affair, they commit adultery, you can let sexual immorality, you can leave. The Bible does not hold you there. They already shattered the covenant. Paul added, if you're married to a non-believer and that non-believer wants to leave, let them go. You're called to peace. You, you can't control whether or not they will ever believe in Christ. If they want to leave, let them leave. Those are grounds for divorce. You and I know Divorce happens for a lot more reasons than that in our culture today, of which God does not accept and which the Bible says God hates. Why? God knows nothing of breaking covenant. God knows nothing of giving his word and changing his mind 
and going back on it and saying, you know what, on second thought, I like them better than you. You're out. I'm going to get somebody else. That's not God. He never does that. He doesn't know anything about breaking covenant. He created a male and female. He made Eve as a perfect helpmate to Adam. He put them together and said, you're no longer two. Now you're one. And what I have joined, what did God say? Don't anybody separate that. I mean, you're just talking about the will of God. Divorce, then, flies right in the face of the will of God. And here you have men doing that. They're divorcing their wives so they can go and marry this new pagan fling, and God hates it. And look at verse 15. This is really telling. But not one has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. What does that mean? Nobody who loves me has been doing that. Nobody who's filled with my Spirit does that. That's not a Christian behavior, he would say. Nobody that has my Spirit and loves and worships me is divorcing their wife so they can marry a pagan woman. That's what you call one of those litmus tests. God says true believers aren't doing that. And... He throws in another. He says, and what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? In other words, when a man wanted to raise godly kids, did he really think that divorcing his wife was going to be the means to obtaining that? Any man that leaves his Hebrew wife to go and marry a pagan woman, don't say you did it so your kids would benefit. You didn't do that for godly kids. You didn't do that to raise a godly family. You did that to satisfy your own sinful lust and pleasure you not only betrayed your wife, but you've betrayed your kids. You've introduced into your children's lives pagan idolatry, sexual immorality. You're, you're affecting them. You see how that sin is spreading? I know people come up with all sorts of reasons today why it was actually good, or we did it for this, or we did it for that. You can tell yourself whatever you want, but God's perspective is totally different. People don't break their covenants when they're children of God, and they certainly don't abandon their kids as children of God. That doesn't happen. So Malachi says, look at verse 15, take heed then to your spirit. What does that mean? You better check yourself. You better take a long internal look at the state of your soul. You better take heed to your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. Stop. Do not do it, Malachi says. It's sort of to drive a wedge in the middle of the culture and say, this better quit. This is not the way believers act. Verse 16, for I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. You're treading on dangerous ground. Do not do this, he says. That's not Christian behavior. You are sinning against your brother. You're sinning against your wife. You're sinning against your children. This gets even more intense, by the way, when you realize that Ezra and Nehemiah were prophesying at the same time as Malachi. So you listen to what they had to say in Ezra 10. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, you have been unfaithful and have married foreign wives, adding to the guilt of Israel. Now therefore, make con excuse me, make confession to the Lord God of your fathers and do his will and separate yourselves from the peoples of the land, and from the foreign wives. Nehemiah said in Nehemiah 13, In those days I also saw that the Jews had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. As for their children, half spoken the language of Ashdod, and none of them was able to speak the language of Judah, but the language of his own people. So I contended with them, and cursed them, and struck some of them, and pulled out their hair, and made them swear by God, You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor take of their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin regarding these things? Yet among the many nations there was no king like him, and he was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, the foreign, the foreign women caused even him to sin. Do we then hear about you, that you have committed all this great evil by acting unfaithfully against our God by marrying foreign women? Even one of the sons of Joiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite. So I drove him away from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Ezra and Nehemiah both said, did you divorce your Hebrew wife to marry a foreign woman? Send her away. You've got to get rid of the foreign wife. They even said in Ezra day, take, she can take her foreign kids with her. You've got to separate here. And we have to address that because it's a perceived contradiction. Because you have Ezra and Nehemiah who clearly say, send them away. Get rid of that foreign wife. Get rid of those pagan kids. But then you come to the New Testament. And here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. 
But to the rest, I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband, and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through a believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. And many see a contradiction here. They say, well, Ezra and Nehemiah said, send them away. Paul said, no, don't. Let them stay if they want to stay. So did God change his mind? Was Ezra and Nehemiah just sort of, you know, off the radar? Is Paul walking contrary to the Old Testament law of God? I mean, what, what do we give here? They're really not a contradiction. The issue of the day is idolatry. In Malachi's day, Ezra's day, Nehemiah's day, you had pagan women who had come in, and these Hebrew men had married these pagan women. And the influence of the pagan wives had overshadowed the marriage. In fact, what did Nehemiah say? They're children. They don't even speak the native language of the Hebrews now. What do they speak? They speak the foreign tongues, right? These women have come in, and they are reintroducing pagan worship into Israel, and that has to go. Now look at what Paul says. Paul says, all right, so you're married to a non-believer. And, and Paul doesn't even address the fact that you may have left a believing wife to marry her. That's probably not what happened in Paul's day. They were probably both lost, and one got saved and wants to know what to do with his, with his lost wife. But Paul says, all right, you're married to a non-believer, and that non-believer will consent to live with you. Now what does that mean? It means they consent to your worship. They consent to your faithfulness. They consent to your God. They consent to follow your path. They consent to follow your lead. So you gave your life to Christ, and you're going to serve Christ, and you're going to worship Christ, you're going to lead this home to serve Christ, and you're going to lead this home to worship Christ, and they're willing to go with that. Paul says, that's fine, they can stay. But if they're not willing to go with that, and you are going that direction, you're going to serve Christ, and they won't, and they want to leave, what did Paul say? That's fine. You see, the issue of the unifying thing is the idolatry. You're not allowing pagan worship to exist. You're not allowing pagan worship to influence the congregation. There was never a time in which Paul said, just bring the pagan in with you. Let her sit in the back corner and she can worship, you know, the, the Greek gods or she can worship the Roman gods in the back and it won't be a big deal. That's not what Paul was saying. If she wants to come and worship the one true God with you, that'll be okay. If she says, I'm not going to worship that God, I'm out of here, then let her go. It's not a conflict. The issue is idolatry. The issue is the influence of idolatry in the congregation. You cannot bring sin into the congregation. That is the same in Paul's day as it was in Malachi's day, as Ezra's day, as Isaiah's day. God has not changed. You cannot bring that sin into the congregation and act like it's no big deal. That is indifference, and that's what they're doing. Divorcing their Jewish wives, marrying a pagan, and bringing it right into the church. A betrayal of their brother a betrayal of their wife, a betrayal of their kids. Number three, it's a betrayal of God. Look at verse 17. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, how have we wearied him? There's that burden of God again, right? God is so tired of listening to your arguments. And that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them, or... Where is the God of justice? Now, we've already seen the betrayal of God insinuated in a couple of verses up ahead. The fact that they profaned God's sanctuary, the fact that they continued to try to worship God even in their sin, but now it actually spells out for them. You have people who are committing sin, and they walk right into the sanctuary, and instead of getting rebuked and instead of getting confronted, what's happening? What sort of welcome do they face when they walk into the church? You're good. It's fine. God is pleased. It's okay. And maybe on some happenstance, somebody comes up and says, no, God hates divorce. And somebody else responds, well, where is the God of justice? I serve a God of love, right? I serve a God that loves me just the way I am. I serve a God that loves unconditionally. My God would never be so hard-hearted or, or you know, rude as to say that a pagan worshiper wasn't welcome. I mean, you hear it all today, don't you? I mean, this has sort of been our M.O. for dealing with horrible sin today. I mean, I already mentioned we've seen where we've basically lost the battle on divorce. That doesn't ever even get discussed today. But now it's going on with homosexuality, isn't it? I mean, is that not the new battleground? It's okay. God loves you just the way you are. We serve a God of love, not a God of judgment. It's okay. You can do it. I, I see abortion beginning to be debated, even amongst the church. Uh, abortion is being something that the church ought to get behind. 
I, I can't imagine a scenario in which a believer could say abortion is something the church should get behind. But, but that's the way this works. It permeates and it spreads. And someone brings iniquity into the congregation. And before you know it, the congregation is no longer confronting it. Now they're condoning it. And they're applauding it. And they're saying, you're fine. God's not angry. God is pleased with you. God loves you just the way you are. That's what they're doing. That's a betrayal of God. They say everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them. Where is this God of justice? Do you see how easily that can happen? How easily you get on this slippery slope and you just start condoning sin and tolerating sin and condoning sin and tolerating sin and before you know it, it's, it's normal to your children. You, you, you who've been here in, in the church for many, many years, I know you can look back over your life and see things that are acceptable now that were never acceptable before. I'm not talking about practice or, you know, temperature or pews or whatever like that. I'm, I'm talking about immorality. I'm talking about sin. Things which the church thinks is okay now that the church never thought was okay before, but it's just been a downgrade a slippery slope, and so hard to drive a stake and climb back up. That's what revival is. When people change their mind about sin, they begin to condone. This is indifference that's going on here. They become indifferent to sin. Ezra said, send them away. Nehemiah said, send them away. Malachi said, cut them off. Paul said, cast out that immoral brother. Jesus said, if they won't repent, let them be, you, be to you like a Gentile and a tax collector. You'll never find Jesus indifferent to sin. Never. Oh, wait, what about that woman caught in adultery? We talked about her in Sunday school a little bit. And that, I told him in Sunday school, that, that's the only story most people know about Jesus these days. Let he who's without sin cast the first stone. That's, that's the one they all know. It might surprise you to know that that story's not even in the oldest manuscripts, which means somebody added it in. It may not even be true. It sounds like Jesus, and so we don't have a problem with it, but in the oldest manuscripts, it wasn't even there. Somebody added it. But I don't have a problem with it. Like I said, it sounds like Jesus. But even in that story, this woman that he saves from judgment, what does he tell her? Go and sin no more. He's not indifferent towards sin. He's not okay with it. He's never been okay with it. That, is, that has never been the way he operates. Jeremiah 5 verse 30. An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule on their own authority and my people love it so. But what will you do at the end of it? It's a good question, isn't it? Here we have a people who are indifferent to sin. And Malachi might as well ask, what do you think you're going to do when the king shows up? You are so eager for him to arrive. What do you think you're going to do when he shows up? You're just going to practice an immediate about face? You're going to take all those pagan women and throw them under the pew? What are you going to do when he shows up? You're not fit for a king. That's the point of Malachi. You're not ready. What are you going to do when he comes? Listen to Paul in the New Testament. This ought to give a good idea of depravity. Romans 1, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, that is to say they didn't care what God thought. They're indifferent. God gave them over to a depraved mind. What does a depraved mind look like? It looks like people who do things they ought not do. They do things which are not proper. Like what? Well, they're filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They're gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinances of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. That's a depraved mind. Do things that God will judge you for and yet applaud somebody for doing it. That's depravity. That's indifference to the things of God. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Romans 12.9 says, Let love be without hypocrisy. And by the way, that's love of God. How do you love God without hypocrisy? Well, you abhor what is evil and you cling to what is good. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, Paul said, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. You understand then why Malachi is writing to these people. You're not ready for the king. You're not ready for his return. You're indifferent to him. Your worship is indifferent. Your treatment of his word is indifferent. Your treatment of sin is indifference. 
you're not ready for that king to come stand in your midst. And here we are, a people who long for the second coming of the Lord. We do. I do. Even so come Lord Jesus. We want him to come. And we have these grand visions that when he come, he will destroy the wicked. Right? He's going to destroy the enemies. He's going to crush those under his feet who are rebellious against him. But my, what a shock it may be to many in the church who find out they're part of that problem. That's a shocking thing to think about. Israel certainly wasn't ready for it, were they? When Jesus showed up, they had no idea that their Messiah would face both barrels at them. When their Messiah showed up, he only declared war one time in his earthly ministry. In the temple. When he threw over tables of money changers. It's the only time he ever declared any war. He didn't go out and fight the pagans. What did he do to Rome? He called Herod a fox, and that's about as far as you can go with it. He never did anything to Rome. He never went after Greece. He never attacked all the pagans. He went after his own because they were not what his people were intended to be. I wonder sometimes if we're ready for the return of the Lord as though we wish we were. I can tell you this, if we are indifferent, then we are not. We cannot be indifferent in our worship. We cannot be indifferent in the way we handle the word of God. And we cannot be indifferent towards sin. Not our own and not our brother's. That's just the reality of it. Our Lord has called us to be holy as he is holy, righteous as he is righteous. And we have to get that right. We have to get that right. Or we are not ready for the king. Let's pray. Father, we come before you because you are our God. And Lord, each and every time we study the book of Malachi, we are thrown again on our face. And we know that we are called to say, I am sorry. We know that we are called to repentance. Lord, I stand up here and preach a sermon, and even as I preach, I look at my own life and think I, least of all men, am worthy to stand up here and preach this. Lord, I, I would confess to you my indifference towards sin, towards my own, towards my brothers. Lord, my unwillingness, even at times, to pay attention to what you say, to take it to heart. My hypocritical worship, Lord, these things should matter more to me than anything else. And God, if I'm honest at times, they don't. And I'm so sorry. And I would ask for your forgiveness of that, God, to be cleansed and to be changed. I pray that, God, on behalf of our congregation, Lord, that we would no longer be indifferent towards worship, towards your word, certainly not indifferent towards sin, that we would not just smile and approve of that which you hate, that we would not applaud it, but that, God, we would stand against sin, we certainly want to see people redeemed from it. We're not longing for people to be judged. We want our brothers to turn back. But, Lord God, we understand that when we enter your sanctuary, it is to bring you holy and pure worship. And I pray, God, that you would cleanse your church. I pray, God, that you would bring revival, that you would bring repentance, that you would wipe away our indifference, that we would be a people who love you with our whole heart and whole soul and whole mind, all our strength, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask you, God, to do this work and forgive us where we fail. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.